It's rare for a drama where the villain's popularity surpasses that of the male lead. But Teabag in Prison Break managed to do just that. Sister, they are blue as the show. They aren't showing, baby, they're flying. Proudly. <laughs> in Prison, he's the one who brings the laughs to the show. Not to mention Teabag's lines that are hilariously absurd. Not that hot! When this guy woke up this morning, he was white! After the escape team of eight successfully breaks out of prison, Teabag loses one hand to John's machete, but Teabag doesn't give up his longing for freedom. He aims to find the $5 million in dirty money that Charles hid in the cellar and then do something no one could ever guess. On his treasure hunt, he encounters David, who is also after the money. With one hand gone, Teabag tries to recruit David to act as his digging partner, however, as soon as David leaves to buy tools, Teabag completely betrays him. Michael and Lincoln, also on the hunt for the money, find Teabag. Lincoln throws Teabag into the car and demands to know if he was the one who tore off the treasure map. Of course, Teabag wouldn't tell them where the map is, but with no way to escape, Teabag concocts a story that David stole the map of KK Farm, successfully diverting their attention. Until they find David, the brothers couldn't let Teabag go. They take him to a deserted place and draw a handgun. In. Teabag himself crawls into the trunk of the car. After dealing with Teabag, the brothers return to Double K Town in search of David. At this time, David is at a hardware store buying tools needed to dig up the cellar. The store owner, thinking David doesn't look like he's from around town but rather like one of America's top eight fugitives, asks David what his grandfather's name is. His name's Grandpa. All right? Look, man, can you just bring this up? I gotta get out. Sensing something off. The store owner throws a stick, knocking David out, and drags him into the storage room to tie him up and hand him over to the police for a bounty. Just then, Michael walks in, sees the scuffle marks on the floor, and immediately understands what happened. He quietly closes the door and, before the store owner can react, punches him. But as Michael heads to the storage room, the store owner, energized by the prospect of a $100,000 bounty, clings to Michael with all his might. Luckily, Lincoln arrives in time to subdue the store owner. After tying up the store owner and rescuing David, they realize Teabag had deceived them. Teabag in the boot is desperately trying to remember every building on the map to make sure that the map is well known and then swallowed the paper little by little. When Michael and the others return, the only thing left on Teabag's chest is a piece of paper from the map he used for boasting. But don't worry, before I destroyed it, I committed it to my photographic memory. Now, only Teabag knows the exact location of the $5 million, leaving Michael and Lincoln no choice but to follow his lead as his diggers. Lincoln directs all his rage towards David. Oh, whoa, whoa. You're not worth 1.5. Get in. Okay. But they haven't yet realized that FBI agent Mahone has spotted the anomaly in the movements of the eight fugitives. They're all converging on Utah, surely hiding a secret unknown to the police. Mahone immediately recalls the money Charles had 30 years ago. Convinced they're after that money, he narrows down his search to prepare for the arrest. Meanwhile, the treasure hunting team, guided by Teabag's memory, has arrived near KK Farm, dreaming of what they'll do with the $5 million. They cross a dirt mound only to be dumbfounded at the sight of KK Farm. 30 years have passed, and KK Farm no longer exists, replaced by a vast expanse of modern buildings. Meaning, the map in Teabag's mind has become utterly useless. Looking for the cellar in such a vast area of buildings is like finding a needle in a haystack. Michael is at his wit's end in despair, yet Teabag still finds it appropriate to crack jokes. What, you got a divining rod tattooed on your ass? I don't want to hear anything out of your mouth other than what your photographic memory spits out regarding that map! You watch your tone with me, boy. I will watch you get tossed to the side of the road to fend for yourself, boy. Because if you can't remember where that silo was... Seeing Michael so angry for the first time, even Teabag gets scared. He tries hard to recall the original location of the farm from his pieced together memory. The farm was next to a fork in the road, surrounded by many trees, and had a towering barn within. After circling the residential area a few times, they finally stop at a fork that seems somewhat similar. Michael, after some analysis, notices that the trees in the area are all about the same height, likely planted at the same time, but two trees are noticeably shorter probably due to not getting enough sunlight, which must mean that a tall building blocked the sun here. And this must have been where the farm's barns stood. Since these houses are smaller and simpler, 
they wouldn't need deep foundations, which means the money hidden in the cellar might still be there, just as they're about to check it out. A still charming blonde woman comes out of the house, digging in someone else's cellar is definitely not feasible. Teabag suggests just doing away with her, but Michael and his brother, having their own moral compass, decide to find a legitimate reason to get inside. While Lincoln is tampering with their house's electric meter, Teabag, the old pervert, is ogling the woman inside with eyes wide as copper bells. I was just looking, pretty. What's that old chestnut? Uh, I can look at the menu, doesn't mean I'm gonna eat. We get in, we get the money, we get out. That's it. No, absolutely. After cutting off the woman's electricity, they let David out of the trunk, they tell him to go back to the tool shop to get some work clothes and shovels, fill up the car with gas, and then hurry back. But who would have thought, while David was grabbing the tools, the store owner's friend stops by, notices the scuffle marks, and immediately calls the police. In a panic, David swings a shovel at him, then locks him and the store owner together. Distracted David forgets to refill the car with gas and hurries back. Lincoln noticed his averted eyes and on inquiry found that he was in trouble. Man, I, I don't know, dude, it just, it set off so fast. Did the fast. call go through? Maybe, man. What do you mean maybe? Did it's, the call go through? Yes, I, no, I don't know. I don't know, man. Their top priority becomes to dig up the money quickly. Michael, posing as an electric company worker, knocks on Jeanette's door, and after some sweet talking, she finally allows them in. Michael says, there's a problem with the cables under your garage floor. We need to dig up the floor to inspect it. But don't worry, we'll fix everything back to normal afterward, and the entire repair process will be at no cost to you. Fine. It's okay, y'all go ahead and do whatever y'all need to do. Jeanette, the noise might be substantial. However, just as they are about to start work, two familiar faces suddenly show up. It turns out they are Benjamin and Sucre, two of the great eight escapees. Sucre's entire reason for escaping was to see his beloved girlfriend Mary Cruz. But upon breaking out, he learns that Mary Cruz has been swept off her feet by his cousin Hector. Just as Sucre arrives at the wedding ready to elope with Mary Cruz, Hector calls the police, reporting a fugitive at the scene. That don't sound good, guys. Desperate and heartbroken, Sucre flees the scene and on the road, he meets Benjamin, who is also out treasure hunting. Now, with six of the original eight-man escape team gathered in Utah, what has become of the other two? In fact, John had the best situation after escaping prison, he not only regained his former status but also reunited with his wife and children and had a secure plan to go abroad. However, just then, he receives a tip-off about the witness who testified against him appearing in a small motel. John, who was always eager to revenge, couldn't bear it and decided to kill him before leaving the country, despite his wife's persuasion. But little did he know, this was a trap set by Mahone to lure John in. You're looking for the rat, John. Fibonacci's 2,000 miles from here. But John was so fed up with prison life that he couldn't go back to prison, so he raised his gun and chose to kill himself. Meanwhile, Haywire, after being ditched by the team, leisurely pedals his way to freedom on a bicycle, with the police focusing most of their efforts on Michael and the others. Haywire remains at large to this day. Back on Michael's side, Jeanette is extremely hospitable, constantly coming in to check on their progress or to offer them something to drink, making it impossible for them to work properly. So, Teabag volunteers to keep Jeanette company and distract her attention. I know how to play nice. I'll be watching. But upon seeing Jeanette's still charming figure, Teabag's gaze doesn't want to leave for even a moment. Teabag tries hard to conceal his inner desires, while Jeanette is completely unaware that she's sitting next to an unforgivable rapist. Join me? Just two fingers. One has to admire Teabag's flirting skills. They talk everything from poetry and songs to life philosophy, just when Teabag thinks he's about to succeed. Jeanette's words chill him to the bone. A strong guy that that doesn't sp speak much. Would you go in there and ask him if he would like to have a drink with me after 
he punches him. It turns out Jeanette is interested in the strong Lincoln. Teabag's self-esteem took a massive hit. He looked at the ice pick on the table, his tongue moving up and down in his mouth. Meanwhile, Michael and the others have successfully uncovered a corner of the cellar, and just need to expand the area to access the money hidden inside. Just as everyone sees hope, David tells them that there was an accident when he went to get the tools. So in his rush, he forgot to refuel the car. Michael is furious upon hearing this. I want you to go back into town. I want you to gas up that car. Because I'm not driving around with millions of dollars in the trunk. Do you understand? And why do I got to do it? Okay. But David is still too young, his dodgy and evasive eyes making it obvious to anyone that something is wrong. The staff immediately calls the police and deliberately delays, waiting for the police to arrive. David noticed an unhooked phone nearby and, upon seeing the portraits of eight wanted criminals overhead, immediately realized the situation and fled in panic. But it's too late. The police relentlessly pursue him to a farm, where Mahone suddenly fires a shot, scaring David into surrendering with his hands up. DROP! Here a group of people dug for half a day and finally noticed something wrong why there is no movement upstairs. Could it be that teabag has harmed someone? Michael rushes upstairs and barges into the room, thankfully finding no harm done. She's got the hots for the big strong one. However, the next second, Jeanette darkly tells them to pack up and leave immediately, not allowing them to finish the work. It's clear that teabag has angered Jeanette. Despite Michael's pleas, Jeanette is adamant about them leaving, but just then, a police officer arrives at the door. In a panic, Teabag quickly grabs a hammer and subdues Jeanette. Hey mom, you home? It turns out the person is Jeanette's daughter, Anne. When and sees the ice scattered on the ground, she immediately senses something wrong and cautiously moves upstairs with her gun drawn. Just then, Jeanette screams. Anne and raises her gun, aiming it at Michael and another person. In the car, it's here. Back away and put your hands up. I put my hand up. I'm gonna take a jugular with it. It's okay. Back away and put your hands up. Just go easy. Go enough. She ain't the one carrying the car. Don't move. Ah. Uh. Ah. Uh, let's be civil. The crisis was finally averted, and the group tied up Jeanette and her daughter, worried that Teabag might kill to keep them quiet. Michael asks Sucre to watch over them while the rest go back to digging for the money. Because Teabag had lost a hand and couldn't help dig the cellar, he sat on the side, flipping through a magazine while teasing Benjamin. Mr. Hundred Dollar Bill, hey, uh, what's it like being with the African persuasion anyhow? You know, shut the hell up. Don't hit me a nerve. Benjamin has never seen such a despicable request in his life and is ready to hit him. But just then, Lincoln sees on TV that his son has been released from prison without charges. Unaware that this is actually a trap set by the government to lure out Lincoln, as expected, the simple-minded Lincoln ignores Michael's advice, drops the shovel, and drives off in Jeanette's sports car to pick up his son. He plans to take LJ and flee the country together. In the interrogation room, Mahone was trying to extract information about Michael and the other's whereabouts from David. However, David remained tight-lipped until Mahone produced a photo of Teabag killing Marvin, gradually breaking down his psychological defenses. David, not inherently a villain but imprisoned over a stolen baseball card, likely chose to reveal the digging location to prevent Teabag from committing more murders. David had one condition, there were hostages inside, and a hasty police raid could provoke a murderer like Teabag into drastic actions. He suggested he should go first, a strategy Mahone agreed with, assembling all available officers to proceed with David to apprehend the suspects. However, upon opening the door, out came a short-haired beauty, who was David's girlfriend. It turned out that David had snitched too much in prison, which had led to the escape team looking down on him. Now, he would rather die than snitch again. David wanted to seize this opportunity to confess his love to his girlfriend, hoping she would wait for him to be honorably released from prison. But before he could finish, the police took him away, leaving Mahone feeling deeply insulted by the intelligence insult. He took David to a deserted roadside and ended David's life with several shots. Mahone then placed another gun, one without fingerprints, in David's hand to fabricate the illusion that David had attempted to grab the gun, thus making it seem like self-defense. At this moment, Mahone's tale finally came out, 
Meanwhile, Sucre, having heard over Anne's walkie-talkie that David was captured, rushed downstairs to inform the group to leave immediately, as the group was at a loss. Benjamin seemed to discover something. Maybe you should. Maybe we all should. Excitedly, they hurried to prepare to leave. However, at that moment, Sucre, always thought to be honest and simple, pointed his gun at the other three, intending to take all the money for himself. With heavy hearts and no other choice, they handed over the travel bag filled with money to Sucre. Watching Sucre walk away with the money, the remaining three were devastated, especially Teabag, who was hiding in a corner, but staying there was pointless. Michael quickly went upstairs to give Janet a knife so she could free herself once they were gone. He also grabbed a rope intending to tie up Teabag for the police, only to find upon returning to the warehouse that Teabag had vanished. I don't know, man. Look, I gotta, I, I, I gotta go. All right. Uh, good luck. Michael then went back upstairs to take his walkie-talkie and rushed towards the woods. However, at that moment, a familiar figure appeared before him. Adios, amigos, huh? You're great. <laughs> Me, you, and Link. Four. We gotta send a share to Charles' daughter. With her father's love, just like I promised. It turned out the act of keeping the money to themselves was a plan they had devised together. But when Sucre opened the money bag, they were both stunned. Inside was nothing but magazines. The real money had already been taken by Teabag. It turns out that when he was reading the magazines, he had planned to take the money for himself. The travel bag given to Sucre was the one filled with magazines. Taking advantage of the other's absence, Teabag had quietly taken the money and left, then bought a second-hand car to drive towards a bright future. I'll, 